A little quick review where we've been. Uh, I'll just make this, you see, shorter and shorter. But uh, the introduction, you know, Hebrews is, is, many see it, see it as a written sermon. Something that's really, it's, you can think of it as being delivered orally. But in the first four verses, you have that powerful introduction, the first four verses of chapter one, where the writer makes the point that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the climax of divine communication. And then he also makes some powerful assertions about the person, work, and status of the Son. And then in verses 5 through 14 of, of chapter 1, he stresses that the Son is superior to the angels. And he does this in a number of different ways. And then given that superiority that he's established in chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, he warns them, and of course us, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, to pay even greater attention than they have been to what they've heard, meaning the word that was spoken through the Son, the message of salvation. So he says, look, Jesus is greater than the angels, therefore you really need to heed this message of salvation. You need not to be lethargic toward it, apathetic toward it. Don't neglect it. Pay attention to it. More attention than you have been paying. And the danger of not doing so is that one will drift away from God's ultimate revelation. Okay, that, that one will be pulled gradually toward an abandonment of one's commitment to Christ. And I, I made the point last week that that's how this works. Anybody who's been around any length of time with Christians knows that's how this works. A person who is strong, vibrant faith, living, active, this kind of thing, doesn't wake up one day and say, hey, I'm through with this. That's not how the enemy operates. The enemy discourages pulls, drifts, who cares about church, I'm not coming, prayer, who cares, you know, God knows everything anyway, er, er, you just drift, 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 and before you know it, you're just, you're just gone, you're just a shell, and that's how it, and, and see these warning signs that are evident, uh, when people see them, that is why brothers and sisters uh, urge you to, hey, you know, are you okay, I'm concerned about you. And, you know, that is, that is people who love you who are involved in doing that. And we'll see some more of that uh, laid out expressly here. And I don't know if we'll get to it today, but uh, you'll see that, the role of the fellowship and how important it is in helping somebody uh, stop this drifting away. Okay, then he says in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, he resumes his exposition on, on the person of Christ that was interrupted, so to speak, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Remember I said he has this exposition on the the person and nature of Christ, and he injects in there these exhortations. Well, the first one was chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Then he resumes his exposition on Christ in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And, and that, this, those verses, they serve as a transition to the discussion in, in verses eight, or 10 through 18 of chapter 2 about the Son's solidarity with humanity. Okay, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, it's going to be a transition to verses 10 through 18. And in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, that's where he introduces Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 6, which contains both elements of exaltation that points back to what he's already said, but it also contains elements of incarnation that points ahead to verses 10 through 18 of chapter 2. And we talked about that uh, last, last week. And one of the things that he says in, in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, is that though we do not yet see the final subjugation of all things to Jesus... We see, in the sense we see through the gospel, we see Jesus who's been crowned with honor and glory because he became a human, subject to human authority. He was for a while made lower than the angels, and he died as a sacrifice for humanity's sins. So you and I live in a world, though the kingdom of God is a present reality, look at this world. We live in a world, there is kind of a veil to it. Okay, it is, the, the kingdom is here, the, the, the age to come has invaded this reality, but it's not the sole reality, because you and I look and we see suffering and death and mourning and pain, and people are saying, wait a minute, you're bringing the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is essentially the divine utopia, it is that reality, that state where the will of God is fully and perfectly expressed, where everything is working in harmony with the eternal purposes of God. And I look around and I see all of this that is out of kilter. All of this suffering and everything. And Jesus tells parables about that. He tells parables where he says, 
the kingdom comes in two stages. There's the inauguration. There is a period of growth when there's this time where it, it coexists with evil. Then there will be the decisive intervention at harvest time when all that is contrary to the eternal purposes of God will be stripped out. And then the kingdom of God will be the sole reality for eternity. Okay, so this is this idea, I think, that the, the Hebrew writer is talking about where he sits here and he says, look, we, we don't yet see the final subjugation of all things, but we do see Jesus who has been exalted above all things, and then the reference to Christ tasting death on behalf of mankind, it leads to this next unit, which deals with the Son suffering on behalf of the heirs. Okay, that was the review, and we were talking about verses, chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. That's one section. I would put it up if it was, but I, I couldn't figure out how to do it conveniently and break it. So I'm taking section 10, verses 10 through 18, piecemeal. Okay, I'm just going to group the text. The first one was chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For it was fitting for him, on account of whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. I, I was talking about this when we ended, this idea of how is it fitting for him, and I gave you my understanding of that. It's fitting in the sense that it's fitting for God uh, to, to do this, to bring to salvation people, because the crucifixion of Christ, his suffering, is what allows God to forgive consistently with his nature, his character. It allows him to forgive righteously. And I gave you know, some examples of that. But uh, what I wanted, to, I wanted to finish up on this by saying when the writer, he says that it was fitting for God to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings, meaning through his death, he's not suggesting that Jesus was in any way imperfect in the sense of being flawed or errant, okay? We, when we hear that, we think, well, what is he saying? That somehow he was imperfect before that time and not at all. Okay, he's not saying that at all. God perfected Jesus through his death in the sense that that act completed or fulfilled God's plan of redemption. Okay, Jesus sinlessly and flawlessly fulfilled his mission at every step. But that mission wasn't completed until he endured the cross. Okay, so he was flawless and sinless but there was a goal toward which he was working in his mission on God's behalf. And so until the time of Jesus' obedience, he wasn't yet perfect in the sense he wasn't yet complete. Now you say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Let me give you a rough analogy. Okay, you can do with this what you, whether you think, how much you think it fits or not. But you know, somebody who has bowled all strikes for nine frames. Okay, you think of that person. Now that person is flawless to that point, right? Hasn't had, you know, all strikes for nine frames flawless, but there's a sense in which the perfection is not yet complete. When do we say it's a perfect game? It's a 300 game. Oh, it doesn't mean he's flawed en route to the 300 game. It means that there is a sense in which it hasn't been completed. And that's what I think he's talking about here. There was a plan in place and his obedience and everything was perfected in that it was completed Okay, so don't, you know, somebody well, it says here, perfected, that means he was imperfect before. No, it doesn't. Okay, no, it doesn't. All right, now, the son's solidarity, let me, all right, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11. For both the one who sanctifies and those being sanctified are all of one, on account of which reason he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praises to you. And again... I will have confidence in him. And again, here am I and the children God gave me. Now both Jesus and those who are sanctified by his atoning death, they all share the same father. They're all sons and, of course, daughters. That's implied. They're all sons and daughters, though Jesus is, of course, the son in a unique sense. Okay, so they all share the same father. And for that reason, Jesus isn't ashamed to call his disciples brothers. You see, however the society may reject them, and you remember the setting here, is that here you have people who are either, they're, they're being pressured somehow to turn back toward Judaism. And there is pressure at work on them, whether it is simply saying, listen, I don't like the rejection of my family and my old culture and all of that. And then I have these rumblings from these pagans and this Jewish, uh, I mean, this, this, uh, the Roman Caesar, Nero, that these pagans are sitting here and they're, they're acting like they're uh, getting a little restless. And I don't like all of that. Well, as the world sits here and, and condemns or turns on 
Christians as they suffer. Jesus says, however the world's treating you, you need to remember that I am not ashamed to identify with you. Okay, so, you know, we're sitting here. I want, I want my culture to identify with me. I want my culture to look at me and say that I'm really a neat guy. I'm one of them. They love me and this kind of thing. I want some other kind of identification. I want the broader society, all that, but they're turning on me and all this. And he says, Christ identifies with you. He is not ashamed to call you his brother. That's what matters. You see, in all of this, he's encouraging them, listen, listen, focus on what really counts, what really is important. However society may reject them, Jesus identifies with them. And then in support of this assertion that he's not ashamed to call the disciples brothers, the writer quotes three Old Testament passages, okay, text. He really goes in two places. He quotes from Psalm chapter 22, verse 22, and Isaiah chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Though that that second statement, I will have confidence in him, that appears in text in addition to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 17. But it looks like he's going Psalm 22, 22, and Isaiah chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Now, he does this in support of the idea that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers, his, the, the disciples' brothers. And the way he, he appeals to that, and these texts, Psalm 22, it clearly was understood by first century Christians as being about Jesus. The interesting thing is, is how is, is Isaiah 8 understood that way? And uh, it looks like the way it was understood messianically is because in chapter 8, verse 14, the Lord is referred there, he's referred to there as a stumbling stone. Okay, in 814, and we know that a number of, of writers, New Testament writers, they apply that to Jesus. The idea of a stumbling stone, you see that in Romans 9, 33 and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. So you have this idea that they're viewing Isaiah 8 messianically, and it also may be because Isaiah's children, they, they were a portent of other things, their names and that kind of stuff, and that may be a signal, hey, that there's something going on in these texts that's not obvious, so maybe that factored into their reading Isaiah chapter 8 messianically. But here we have this writer who's, who's appealing to these verses as about Jesus. In these texts, they support that Jesus isn't ashamed to call them brothers by their reference to my brothers and his close association with the children. Okay, He's with them and God gave them to him. And by his expression of devotions, devotion to the Father, which stress his sonship and therefore link him fraternally with the other sons and daughters. So I think that's what's going on when he says he's not ashamed to call them brothers and he calls out these three texts from the Old Testament and I think that's how they support it. They have this idea of my brothers, that reference. You have this close association of Jesus with the children and you have his uh, sonship evident which then establishes this fraternal relationship to the other sons and daughters. I think that's what he's doing. Okay, but anyway, his point he's making, he says, look, Jesus isn't ashamed to call them brothers. Whatever the world, however the world sees them. And how does our society see us? I'm telling you, our society doesn't see us as, you know, we're seen as backward. I got to tell you, you know, you're seen as backward if you believe the Bible is true. Now, I don't care if you carry a big Bible around this kind of thing and don't believe it's true. If it's seen as a matter of something, you know, I just used to, to get by people with or whatever. But if they get a whiff that you really believe the Bible is the word of God and that it's God speaking to mankind and that it's true, that frightens people. Absolutely, they, they, it freaks them out. They just sit here and they think, wait a minute, this guy's a nut. You know, he's like a religious extremist kind of thing. Well, you know, people say that kind of stuff. Well, you know, what do you mean? Fundamentalist is the word. They, you know, so you, if by that you mean I believe the Bible? Then yes, I do. I believe the Bible is Christians have believed the Bible for millennia, and I don't apologize for it. Well, you can't believe that anymore. Well, that's the debate. I say you can and do. You see? So that's the thing, and, and we, can't, we can't lose that. We can't lose that. But the, our world, and, and here is this word of comfort that says, as the world looks at us, down its nose at us, and says, well, you're a backward, you know, you're some kind of guy living in the dark ages, and you want to oppress people and do all the caricatures that they make up about how Christians are to be. So as the world looks at you that way, I want you to know Jesus stands with you and says, I'm not ashamed to identify with you. I'm with you, okay? And I like that. And, I, and these, these folks needed to hear that. They needed to understand uh, uh, that this is what, what, what's going on. Now, there's some uncertainty as to when the author understands Jesus to fulfill these texts. 
to say these things, right? I mean, we look here and say, okay, he's obviously saying that these things are dealing with Christ. He fulfills them. But when did he fulfill them? Where did he fulfill them? He doesn't spell that out for us. And you have different ideas on when that could have happened. You know, whether the statements uh, the, that the son made, before, whether they were before the incarnation, whether they were during his earthly ministry, whether they were after his ascension, revealed to the writer by God, whether there was some combination of those things, he simply doesn't tell us. But it doesn't alter the fact his point. And the reason I'm convinced he doesn't tell us the timing is it's not relevant to his point. His point that he's making, he says, listen, wherever he said these things, whenever he said these things, they emphasize the solidarity of the son with the sons. Okay? He's saying these things are about Christ, and wherever and whenever he says them, they emphasize the solidarity of the son with the sons and daughters of God, that he's not ashamed to call them brothers. I think that's why he doesn't, he doesn't say, because, you know, we look at this stuff and say, listen, I have these questions. I want you to tell me, when did he say these things? And I understand that. That's healthy curiosity. Okay, but the fact is, he doesn't. He doesn't tell us. And so you can sit there and shake this book all you want and squeeze these pages, and he doesn't tell us when he fulfilled these things. And so you have different people, as I say, saying, well, he, he did it before the incarnation in the earthly ministry, after his ascension. All right, I think the reason he leaves it that way is because it doesn't matter, because the point is the identity of Christ with the sons and daughters. Okay, I think that's, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's doing. Chapter 2, verse 14. Since, therefore, remember, 10 through 18, the section, I'm just breaking this up in bite-sized chunks. 2, 14 through 16, he says, Since there the children have shared blood and flesh, he also likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might nullify the one having the power of death, that is, the devil, and free these as many as were held in slavery by fear of death through all their living. For clearly he is not concerned about angels, rather he is concerned about the descendants of Abraham. Well, since the children of God are human... Okay, here we are. They're made of blood and flesh. The son also became a human in order to nullify the devil's work of death. Whose work is that? Death is the devil's work. And so he came to nullify that work. He became a human being to conquer human mortality. And I like it. <laughs> I like it. There's no story, no message like this anywhere. He became a human being to conquer human mortality, to conquer death by providing resurrection life for the children of God and as a result to free them from their fear of death. Right here is, he's conquered death. He's given us resurrection life, so what is death to us? Right? It, it's, death is not the end. Death is not something that's the last word because we are destined for resurrection life. And so he says that to free them so that he frees them from the fear of death and the way he accomplished this nullification of the devil's work was through his own death. You see, through his own death, by his sacrifice for sin, Jesus removed that which gives death its sting. You see, that which makes death painful. The sting of death is sin. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Death without the yoke of sin is a passage into the glorious presence of Christ. As you see in Acts chapter 7, verse 59, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. So you have without this yoke of sin, death is the passage into the glorious presence of Christ, which leads ultimately at Christ's return to the resurrection of the body. Okay, so we have this, what is death? What is death for us? And so death is no longer to be feared, and the subtext of that is, Remember, what's he doing? You have people who are being drawn. They're sitting here saying, look, this is a real drag. This is difficult. Nero's making noise. Uh, you know, Christianity's not protected, as is Judaism. This is scary. This is scary. And he's sitting here letting them know. He says, listen, look, death is no longer to be feared. The subtext is that the threat of death shouldn't draw you away. Now, you think about that. If I'm reading this correctly, if what he's saying to them is, I have conquered death and provided resurrection life. Therefore, death ought not be a tool to pull you away. And that gives you something about the seriousness of the faith of the early church. 
And when we look at that, we say, you know, I, you know, how is it that the church just exploded and did all this kind of stuff? I'm telling you, the, the stuff is there. It's in the depth of the belief and the understanding and the, whole, the, the reality of the resurrection where people say, listen, what can you do to me? What can you do to me? Kill me? All right. That's why, see, they beat these people all over the place. Did all kinds of things to them, killed them. And they couldn't shut them up. Why is that? Because they understood that the enemy has been conquered. The enemy has been conquered. And what can the world do to me? And so I think all of that is wrapped up in here. When he says that Jesus came, came here to nullify the devil's work. For as these Christians well understood, this last thing here, where he says, this, for clearly he's not concerned about angels, rather he's concerned about the descendants of Abraham. For as these Christians well understood, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, it wasn't for angels, but for the descendants of Abraham, meaning humans who through faith inherit the promises of Abraham. Not just talking about physical descendants of Abraham, talking about those who will receive the gift that he, he makes available for all. You know, the idea of descendants of Abraham in that sense, in a Romans chapter 4, verse 11 sense, in a Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8 sense, in a Galatians chapter 3, 7 through 9 sense. Who are the children of Abraham? Who are the descendants of Abraham? Those who share the faith of Abraham, which when Jesus comes, that's Christians. We are the descendants of Abraham. So it's not about angels, it's about the saints. You see, it's about the saints, and that's what he's talking about, I'm convinced, there. And then he says, in verse 17 and 18, he says, For which reason he was obligated to become like the brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, in order to make atonement for the sins of the people. For because he has suffered, having been tested himself, he is able to help those being tested. Now these verses, they lead into the central section of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 4, verses 14 through chapter 10, verse 25, which talks about Christ's high priesthood. This is, that's the meat, that's the central section of the book of Hebrews, and these verses lead into that section. They're linked to that section by a number of common words and phrases, but before developing that, before taking off on that main section that he's here introducing, we're going to get the second uh, hortatory interjection, the second interjection where he's going to exhort the people. Okay, so he's preaching on, and it's like he stops and then says, telling them, you need to do this, do this, exhorting them, exhorting them. Then he'll pick back up with the exposition. Then he'll come over here, and based on what he's saying, he'll exhort. Okay, and so there's, before he gets to that section, you can see the sections are tied from these common words and things, but then there's going to be this, this interjection here that's going to run from chapter 3, verse 1, down through chapter 4, verse 13. Well, here in these verses in 17 and 18, he says it's because of his concern for God's children, the descendants of Abraham, that he was obligated to share fully in their humanity. Okay, he was obligated to share fully in their humanity because only by doing so could he become a high priest who's able to offer the ultimate sacrifice to make atonement for the sins of the people. There's some way he needed to become a human to serve in that capacity, to serve as a high priest. The high priest, as you know, he was the preeminent figure in the Old Covenant, the preeminent religious figure in the Old Covenant. Let me read you what George Guthrie says. He says, he oversaw the ritual worship of God and functioned as the main representative between the nation and Yahweh. Although the high priest shared a number of duties with other priests, he alone entered the most holy place on the annual day of atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. So remember you have people here who are what? They're thinking uh, this Judaism kind of looks tasty. And he's going to let them see that Jesus, you want a high priest? You're looking at him. He's the ultimate high priest. He's a high priest that shows that the high priests of Judaism have nothing. And so he's going to develop that uh, at length. But as, as he indicates in chapter 5, verse 1, every high priest is taken from among human beings. And so, so for Jesus to serve in that role, he needed to become a human. Where do you get high priests? You get them from among people. And so he becomes a human being that he might serve in the capacity of high priest as the ultimate high priest. 
And that's what he does. He comes and offers himself in sacrifice. The writer then closes this section. He closes this part of the address with a note of, of tremendous encouragement. He says, for because he has suffered, having been tested himself, he is able to help those being tested. Now, Jesus is intimately familiar with the conflicts and tensions between faithfulness and human existence. Don't they, aren't they there? Conflicts and tensions between faithfulness and human existence. Aren't you pressured for life not to be faithful to Christ? Aren't there things that squeeze on you and press you to sit here and say, compromise here, don't do this? Life is full of that stuff, right? I mean, life is full of that, and he is intimately familiar with those pressures. And he's, he was tested to the extreme. He was tested to, to the extreme through his suffering and death, and yet he proved to be a faithful high priest. He understands the tensions between faithfulness and life in this world. And because of the, for that reason, he's uniquely able to help those who are facing the hardships that accompany faithfulness. If you don't want to be faithful, okay. You know, you don't have hardships really in this sense. Because as soon as something pushes, you just collapse. Where does the pressure come? It's when you withstand. And he withstood fully. He withstood ultimately. He faced the full fury of the enemy. Because he was sinless, perfect, completely obedient. That's when Satan's raging, trying all he can. So he knows. He knows the pressures that you're under. When you, you, know, when you have this conflict between faithfulness and the pressures of the world. You know, what can you tell him about it? He knows it. He understands it fully, completely. He understands it experientially. Okay, then he goes after this. So I say, this is going to lead into the main section, for 414 through 1025. But before he does that, we're going to have another one of these uh, hortatory interjections, an, an interjection of exhortation. Uh, Ross laughing at my hortatory there. <laughs> I can just say, an exhortation, an inter interjection of exhortation. Okay, and it's going to go from chapter 3, verse 1, down to chapter 4, verse 13. We'll see how far we get on that. We're not getting that far. Chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Okay, now he's going to exhort them. He says, therefore, holy brothers, sharers of the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, being faithful to the one who appointed him, as also Moses was in all his house. For this one has been considered worthy of much more glory than Moses, just as the one who built the house has much more honor than it. For every house is built by someone, but the one who built all things is God. And Moses, on the one hand, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of the things to be spoken. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if only we hold fast the confidence and the boast of the hope. Well, given that Jesus is intimately familiar with the conflicts and tensions between faithfulness and human existence, what he just said, well, given that fact, the writer urges his readers to consider Jesus' example in that regard. Okay? You see how he is. He's intimately familiar with those pressures and tensions. Well, consider his example in that regard. Despite all the difficulties he faced, he remained faithful to the one who appointed him. You want an example? No, well, I can't be expected to do this. This was difficult. This was hard. Look at Christ. Look at his example. Look what he went through. Look what he said yes to. And he says, look there for encouragement. He tells them to look to Jesus. Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession in that he was sent by God to atone for sin. Okay, the role of the high priest. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. And he says, though Moses, obviously Moses is a highly exalted figure in Judaism. Right, I mean, Moses is, you know, he's top drawer when it comes to Judaism. But though he's highly exalted, Moses is this highly exalted figure. He also was faithful in the face of testing, but Jesus is considered worthy of much greater honor than Moses. Much greater honor than Moses. See, all things have been subjected to Jesus. That's this idea of exaltation. All things have been subjected to him. No one is his peer. 
He's considered worthy of much greater honor than Moses. The difference between Christ and Moses is like the proverbial difference in honor between the one who builds a house and the house that is built. This is a, this is a proverb. People understood this. This was used in different contexts. That the one who builds something is worthy of greater glory and honor than the thing he built. And so he's saying that the difference in, between Christ and Moses is on the order of the proverbial difference between the one who builds a house and the house itself. He's in a different league. That would hit people. When you're talking about Moses, you say, listen, Moses is great, he was all that, but I'm telling you, there's nobody like the Son. Nobody like the Lord Jesus Christ. And having appealed to this proverbial truth about the builder being worthy of more honor than the house that's built... He then adds this truism that every house is built by someone and thus for every house you see there's someone who receives greater honor. And since God is the creator of the universe, he's the creator of all things, he's the one who built all things, his honor is unfathomable. That's what I think he's adding this little thing here. If the one who builds is greater than that which is built, then he's the builder of all things. What is his honor and glory like? And so I think that's, that's where he's moving and how this is working. And Moses, he says, was faithful as a servant in God's house. Okay, as a member of the house of Israel. Then he adds this thing about, which is kind of a, a curious clause here, where he says, uh, for a testimony of the things to be spoken. See, Moses here, Moses is faithful as a servant in God's house, as a member of the house of Israel, bearing witness to the fullness of God's later revelation in the Son. You see, that's what's in, this, in the Old Testament. And as an example, here's what the Guthrie, or Coaster I'm quoting here, he says, for example, when Moses speaks of the blood of the covenant, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20, he foreshadows the new covenant that God would make through Christ. So you have Moses in here, when it says here that uh, for a testimony of the things to be spoken, he's pointing forward. He's pointing forward to the one who is exalted above all things, the one whose honor is greater than the honor of Moses on an order that the one who builds a house is greater than the honor of the house itself. He's pointing to the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming one, the coming son. Then Christ, on the other hand, he says, was faithful as a son over God's house, over the new covenant people he founded, not in the house. Over the house, not in the house. And then Guthrie writes, he says, servants have an obligation to faithfulness but sons have a special vested interest in and authority over the house. Jesus displayed a filial, a son-like kind of faithfulness as the Lord and founder of his house, the new covenant people of God. So you see this idea he's saying, what are they looking for? They're thinking priesthood, these other things, that was kind of cool. I like that, I like the comfort. He's going to talk about Jesus is the real, great, true high priest. Jesus is so much greater than Moses. So what are you talking about? Why are you going to turn back toward the inferior from the superior? You already have in Jesus Christ the ultimate. And you're talking about, well, you know, I, I think I'll just kind of go over it. No! Now, how do we do that, you see? We turn back, not, not usually to competing religions, although sometimes that happens, but our idea is we want to turn toward the culture. We want to turn toward, you know, worldliness, but the price is the same. If you turn from this one, you have to see it. And I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know how to get people to see it. I can, you know, I talk till I'm purple. And I cannot get into pe some people's heads and just sit here and say, you know, I would like to take this and just go. <laughs> but I can't. I cannot. But people have to see what is at stake here. Now, how do you get people to see that? You are talking about when you say, well, I, you know, this is really attractive to me, the way the world lives and all this kind of... Look what you're turning from. You know, I think of Peter, to whom shall we go? Where are you going to go? You're going to go to a world that's simply going to use you, destroy you, and then leave you. Or are you going to hold to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one? The one, everybody, you know, just, he's the promised one. You see, and he wants people to see that, to understand it, because they're in danger of drifting, and he's just trying to tell them, listen, this is real. Okay, this is real. We tend to think, well, those people back then, you know, it was easy for them to believe this kind of stuff and all that kind of thing. They had pressures. They had stuff to pull them. They had culture. They had all this other stuff. 
Okay, we have to see what this is and what is involved and what's at stake in somebody turning away. Now, the author and his readers, not the Jews, okay? It's the author, the writer and his, and his readers, not the Jews, who are the new covenant people of God. Okay, we are the covenant people of God. Those who confess the name of Jesus Christ are the covenant people of God. We are of the faith of Abraham. Because Christ came, the Father sends the Son, and we say, I trust you in that. We are in that showing the faith of Abraham. It is those who say, no, he didn't, who are denying what God did and showing that they do not have the faith of Abraham. I don't care what their lineage is. I don't care if they can trace themselves back wherever. You don't accept Jesus Christ, and you're not of the faith of Abraham. And that's what Paul says. We are the children of Abraham. We are the descendants of Abraham because we share the faith of Abraham. But he wants them to know that look, the new covenant people, they're the new covenant people of God, but the continuance of that privilege depends on holding fast their boldness or confidence and holding fast their pride in their hope and the hope they profess. In other words, he's telling them, listen, you must not surrender your faith under the pressure you're facing. See, that's the key objective that he wants. They are in danger of surrendering their faith. And he tells them, listen, all of this is yours, but you must hold it. You don't sit here and say, listen, yes, Christ died for me. Yes, I understood that. Yes, I'm a Christian. And then turn away from that, throw that away, go back into the world, go into Judaism or whatever's pulling them, and then turn around and think, well, that's okay. He says, no, you have to hold it. You have to hold on to that confidence. You have to maintain your commitment. And what happens, see, year in, year out, it's easy for Christianity. I, I may have mentioned this before. I remember I had this guy told me uh, he'd been a Christian for a good while, and he said the pixie dust has gone away or something. And what he meant, kind of like the sparkle and the newness and like, you know, the mind-bending transformation where you walk through the looking glass and you're saying, wow, I never thought of reality like this, but it's a mind-blower. Then when you've been over here a while, you know, it becomes more routine. Okay, and there is this, you know, the enemy uses all kinds of things. He uses this fact of, you know, dullness or whatever, and he uses all of these things, but the, his, what he's after, okay, I've told you that what he is after, all of the rest of the stuff, it's, it's just smoke and mirrors. What he is after is you saying in your heart, I cease relying on the crucified Savior. I cease trusting in him. I'm through with it. That's what he's after. Okay, whether it's pulling you into sin, you know, which then you, he uses to have you say, well, I'm not worthy, I better chuck it. Okay, he wants you to surrender that. That's what he's after, and he pulls people, and he's always been doing that, but we have to hold, we have to hold. And that's why we're involved with one another. That's, the, you know, a key purpose of the body of Christ. We're not a social club, although we certainly have social aspects. We are a fellowship of the body of Christ and we exist to help one another in our faithfulness. And if we're not functioning that way, then there's something wrong. And we have to do that. We have to help one another, encourage one another, call one another to holiness and not be afraid to help one another in that regard because you do that and somebody says, ah, leave me alone. Okay, well, that's just the porcupine idea of trying to blow people off and that's just part of how Satan works to keep the body from functioning properly so it can help people. So we sometimes have to say, no, listen, you don't really need that. And people are going to get upset sometimes. But see, you can't allow that possibility then to cause the body to cease to function as a body. Well, people don't like that. Well, I don't doubt they don't like it. You know, nobody likes to be talked about and said, hey, you know, when you were over here, was that really a good thing to do? Should you do that? How are you doing? You know, do you, are, are you struggling with things? People don't like it, but I'm saying we have to hold, and that's what he tells me. He's going to say that many times through here because these people were being tempted. They're drifting and being tempted not to hold. All right, I'll just read this, and we'll see. How, oh, i got about a minute, so I'll just read this and talk, and when the bell rings, I'll shut up. All right, chapter 3, verse 7, he says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in accordance with the day of the testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me with a test and saw my works for 40 years, Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they are always going astray in the heart, and they, they did not know my ways. As I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. Now, given the need 
to hold fast to their confession of faith that he has just mentioned, the writer urges them to heed what the Holy Spirit is saying to them through Psalm 95, chapter, verse 7, the last part, through verse 11. See, they must not harden their hearts as did the Israelites when they rebelled against God in the wilderness. You see, this, this was something that's paradigmatic for New Testament writers. Paul refers to this. This idea, you know, well, that's just Old Testament stuff, the Israelites in the wilderness. No, he's saying, listen, they're speaking to you through this. You see, don't be like them, winding up hardening your hearts and turning away and, and chucking Christ, because you see, that didn't play out very well for them, did it? What was the consequence when they rebelled against God? What was bad? And he's saying to them, the consequence, if you don't hold to your faith, if you harden your heart and you turn against Christ, it's going to be bad. It's not going to be the cakewalk that society is trying to tell you. Oh, yes, turn away from those small-minded, those oppressive people. Come out into the wonder of the world and it'll be flowers. And you'll just be, oh, it's not like that. Okay, that is a mirage that the enemy is giving you to say, quit Christ. Now, can you understand? Do you know there's a spiritual war going on? There is a spiritual war going on. Well, that's what people long ago thought. No, that's the truth. There's a spiritual war that is going on, and there are all kinds of things in play. And if you're not tuned into it, this is the kind of stuff they sell you. And you sit and go, well, that's kind of good. I do feel kind of oppressed. Wow, I can't really, you know, I'd like to do that. Okay, so he says, listen, it didn't turn out well for them. And I'm stopping right there. Thank you. <laughs>